This is why when we come, we're not looking to entertain, but we are looking to be serious about being Berean believers and getting into the Word of God and letting the Spirit of God be poured out upon us and seeking Him and crying out to Him and not looking to just come in and be entertained. Because that you, you give an inch and the devil will always take a mile. Every time. And so this is serious. And when we come together, we want to say, Lord, have your way. Let your spirit be poured out amongst us and let us worship you in spirit and in truth. Because we are here to glorify you and to honor you as your people. Amen. Are you with me on that? Amen. And so I just say all that to you to, to say once again, folk, we're really nearing the end. You can look out at the other things like what's going on in the Middle East and Israel and all that. Those are indicators, too. But I'm telling you, one of the biggest indicators that's often not spoken of is the apostasy, even within the body, even within the professing body of Christ. This was mentioned so often. Jesus mentioned it. Paul mentioned it. John mentioned it. Peter mentioned it over and over again. And we're really seeing it. We're really, really coming down to the end. And, and may God help us just to stay true to him no matter what. No matter what anyone else says or what anyone else does, th this has to be the standard. Amen? Amen? No, are you with me on that? Can, can I get a, a hand up if you're with me on that? Okay, good. My daughters are raising their hands and my wife. I'm kidding with them. Good. So we're all together on this. Amen? I'm kidding with them. God is good. All right. So now I'm going to ask the question. Have you got your Bibles? All right, if you do, we're going to head back to James. Let's head all the way back to the book of James, toward the back of your New Testament. And we're in James chapter 3. James chapter 3. And we'll begin reading in verse 1, just to get context. We covered verses 1 and 2 last week. But for context, we'll get that, and then we'll read through uh, verse 5. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, they're still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. So today... We're going to begin this topic on the power of the tongue. And I want to make it very, very clear that as we look here in James at the power of the tongue, we are not talking about the power to create our own realities. There are some that, that teach, you know, it's the blab it and grab it, confession stuff. Name it and claim it. You may have heard these phrases. That's obviously not what James is getting at at all, and that's not the discussion at all. Um, and we have to be balanced in all of that anyhow, and that stuff is, uh, is not balanced. But it, there is a reality to the power of the tongue. And we're going to begin to study that tonight, and we'll actually, should Jesus tarry, and we get through a couple of other um, sessions, we'll go through portions here of James chapter 3, and we'll see how much emphasis James puts on our words and on our tongue. Our tongue is our communication. That's how we communicate one with another. Nowadays, we also have a, some of this lesson, and I, I did not write this down, so I'm going to say it now while I'm thinking about it. Some of this lesson can also apply now in the age of, of digital media and social media, whereby our fingertips could also be a part of of what he talks about when it comes to the tongue, because now we have the ability to communicate with people via typed in messages that go out instantly everywhere. So a portion of this, I want you to also consider not only the tongue, but also our fingertips, because we now use those to communicate, uh, which they were not able to do in the same manner back then, but I, I think it applies. But James chapter three, the power of the tongue, um, I, I pray that the Lord will help us tonight 
uh, as we get ready to pray, I'm reminded of the lady during a, a, some meetings of, of revival came to the pastor and she said, Pastor, I really struggle with my tongue. And uh, I need to and I want to put it on the altar. And he said, uh, my sister, we don't have an altar big enough. Um, folk, this is a serious thing. We need to understand it and recognize the truth behind the power of the tongue. Amen. And Lord, help us to be willing to give every portion of who we are, including our lips and our tongue, our words. Let us give that to the Lord to glorify him. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. I pray you administer to us, strengthen us, help us, Lord, to recognize the power of the tongue. You've given us the power to speak, to communicate one with another. Way beyond anything in the animal kingdom, we have souls. We are made in your image. And you've given us this, this power of speech, this power of communication. And Father, as we begin this study of James 3, very practical, I'm asking that you would give to us eyes to see and ears to hear. Two ears we have to hear, two eyes to see and to understand, Lord, that the tongue is a powerful, powerful part of who we are. But boy, it can go sideways real quick. Would you help us tonight? Lead us and guide us as we go through this study. And we'll thank you and honor you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So there are a couple of, of our um, commands that are given here in this portion of Scripture and we need to uh, recognize them. And I'm just going to point them out to you at the beginning. In verse 4, we've got the word look or look at. And then in verse, at the end of verse 5, we've got the word see. So James is communicating again. Here's a verb. It's an action. We need to look at something. We need to see something. Both of these words in the Greek, the same word. And, and we need to pay attention, in other words. Really think and see this for what it is because God wants to speak to us about the power of the tongue. So we begin in, in verse 3 and it says, Now if we put bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But we begin by talking about this small little part of our body, the tongue. Nowhere close to the largest uh, part of our anatomy at all. And yet it has incredible power. More power than our fists, than our arms, than our legs, than, than anything else. This small little part of who we are has this power to do all kinds of, of wreck and damage and destruction. It can also do good things as well. But James will begin with something that we may give little consideration to, but that we must not be fooled on to think it doesn't matter because it actually does matter. In fact, it would be just a disaster and a huge mistake to think that because the tongue is so small, it doesn't mean very much and it doesn't have uh, any kind of real functionality in our lives. In fact, James is going to give us four examples, and I just gave you the first one as we read again in verse 3. He's going to give us four examples to illustrate how much power small things can contain. The first one we're about to get into is the bit in a horse's mouth. The second one will be, of course, the rudder on a ship. The third one will be the tongue itself. It's small, but it has great power. And then the fourth one will be what can start small can end up consuming an entire forest. A fire that gets out of control, no matter how small, can blow up into something big real quick. And so we'll study those four examples this evening. And we begin with this first illustration of the small bit that controls such a large animal. Horses are generally bigger than us, bigger than us. Really big, huge animals. And yet all it takes is a small little bit in their mouth and then a rein uh, with that to control the animal. Small, but yet powerful to move them to the right or to the left to get them to move forward or to halt. All these things in the horse's mouth. Now you have to understand, I know today we've got horse power many fold over in our vehicles, but in the days that James was riding, the horses were considered the preeminent part of the Roman army. 
of the Roman cavalry, if you would. And it was a powerful, powerful force. All of these horses and all of these soldiers on them, they could march into battle and they had great, tremendous power at their disposal. And yet it all took place with a small bit in the horse's mouth that could move that horse in one direction or the other. And James wants us to understand that the Bible tells us very clearly that there are all kinds of functions of the tongue. In fact, maybe I can say it this way. There are different kinds of tongues in the Bible, and I'm not talking about speaking in tongues, in which we believe in, but I'm just going to give you some examples because there are many mentions of different kinds of tongues. There's the flattering tongue in Psalm 5.9. There's the proud tongue in Psalm 12 and in Psalm 73. There's a lying tongue that's mentioned in Psalm 109 and in Proverbs 6. There's a deceitful tongue in Psalm 120. There's a perverted tongue in Proverbs 10 and in Proverbs 17. There's a soothing tongue in Proverbs 15 and verse 4. There's a healing tongue in Proverbs 12 and verse 18. There's a destructive tongue in Proverbs 17 and verse 4. There's a mischievous and wicked tongue in Psalm 10:7. There's a soft tongue in Proverbs 25, 15, and there's even a backbiting tongue in Proverbs 25 and verse 23. There are all different kinds of tongues mentioned in the Bible, and oftentimes they're associated with bad things that people do. Isn't it terrible that the Bible has to mention all these horrible things? Wouldn't it be great if there, ha if there didn't even have to be any mention of this? That if all we read was there's a glorifying tongue and there's an uplifting tongue, and, and there's a uh, speaking the truth in love tongue. And if that's all we had in the Bible, that would be great. But, you know, we have all these other examples because we are fallen people and we live in a fallen world. And unfortunately, that small member of the body, just as the bit controls the horse, the tongue can create all kinds of problems. And it can direct people in their lives in one direction or the other. I'm reminded of Psalm 64.3. There the tongue is called a sword. And a sword certainly can do damage. It can, it can bruise. It can wound. In fact, the, the sword of the tongue has killed more people than I think all the swords down through human history, if you want to really get serious about it. The tongue, the sword of the tongue has done all kinds of damage. You and I have seen it many times. You get the young married couple. They're so in love. Before they get married, right, hardly a harsh word is spoken. It's lovey-dovey. It's all wonderful. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. And oh, you look so handsome. Oh, you look so... And, and all of this stuff over and over and over. But then at some point in the marriage, the honeymoon phase begins to fade out. And suddenly one day the husband, or it could be the wife, come in and they've had a bad day. And suddenly a word is spoken. A harsh word. A mean word. A destructive word and it can absolutely damage and hurt the feelings and even the affections as in the love that people have one for another because a harsh word goes out there's no need for hands slapping or kicking or anything else the tongue does far more damage and, and has broken you talk about broken relationships that almost always starts with the tongue it's very rarely a physical thing that starts it. It's the power of the tongue to do all kinds of damage. And of course, I think we would do well to remember the old saying that, you know, once you shoot the arrow, you can't pull it back. Once the water begins to go under the bridge, there's no backing that up. It's already gone through. And once words leave our lips, there's no retrieving them. It's over. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It does not take the place and undo the damage that is done. There can be forgiveness. Then there should be forgiveness. But we all have probably been guilty at times of going off on the mouth and then thinking that I'm sorry is just going to correct everything. But once those words get out, they can never be retrieved. Again, I would say the same thing on social media. We need to be so careful with social media, really double and triple and quadruple think before you hit send on anything. Because once that stuff goes out and people read it, oh, I didn't mean it like that, or I didn't mean this, it's out there. So we have to be so careful, and it's the same thing with 
our tongue and with what we say and how we say it. Once it's out there, it can never be retrieved. We can forgive, we can move on, but damage is done, isn't it? And then there has to be all this extra work to try and build back up. And so, you know, the tongue is like that bit in the horse's mouth. It controls the entire animal and our tongue controls every part of who we are and it controls our relationships. You can have a relationship with someone that can go down a good path if you control your tongue. Or you can damage a relationship if you can't control your tongue and absolutely destroy it in some cases. All because of this little part of who we are, our tongue, and our ability to communicate and to send out words. I don't know about you, but sometimes I wouldn't mind being deaf. Would you? Sometimes it'd probably be better not to hear. And I, made, I had to make a, um, a cry to the Lord many, many years ago. And I've, I've done my best to keep this. That uh, because it goes along with 1 Corinthians 13 about love. You cannot keep a record of wrongs. And when it comes to my ears and what, I mean, I hear things, but I have to just let it go. In this instance, the saying is a good saying. Let it go one ear, in one ear and out the other if it comes to damaging things. You, you have to do your best to do that and to move forward. But when it comes to our tongue and things going out from us, it can do a lot of damage, just like that horse's bit can control that entire animal. May God help us to recognize the power of the tongue. Amen. So that's the first illustration. The second one is in verse four. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, they're still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. And so now James moves from the bit in the horse's mouth to these huge things that we call boats, or in this case, these huge ships. And he talks about the rudder, the small little part on the back of the ship that is not nearly as big as the ship itself, but it can control the direction of the ship. Isn't that kind of amazing when you think about it? Just the small little rudder on the back of the ship, but it runs the entire huge vessel as far as what direction it's going in. It's really, a, it's really an incredible thing. The Romans by the time that James wrote, had learned to build these massive, massive ships. And they actually had, uh, these ships were so big that they had to be propelled by three banks of oars. I mean, people, boom, boom, boom. And they're, you know, one, go, get all this. And they're, they're propelling them. But yet at the back, there's this little thing called a rudder that's there. In fact, the um, the, the Romans would use these ships as massive grain ships regularly and would bring tons of grain into places like Egypt on these, on these massive boats. Remember the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27 and he had that shipwreck? He was on one of those massive boats. And so these things are huge and yet James makes a point and it's a simple point but it's a powerful point. The small rudders at the end of the boat controlled completely the direction that the boat took. And here we've got this discrepancy again between large and small. So the body is, is one size and then the tongue is a small part, but it's very powerful. The bit in the horse's mouth is small, not anywhere close as big as the horse, but it controls the horse. Now here we've got small, large, we've got this massive ship and we've got a small rudder, but what's in control? The rudder ends up guiding the ship. And, and so there's highlighting here as we move forward and we'll get to the, uh, to the rest of it in a little bit, but he's highlighting. James is making a point here. And then he also stresses, right, when it comes to these ships, that sometimes there are strong winds. Do you see that? And they drive the boat. And without the rudder, the strong winds could force it out of control. Again, Acts 27 and the Apostle Paul in the shipwreck. Folk, our circumstances in life are often like the strong winds. They are things that are unavoidable, that we did not create. Oh, I didn't know this was going to happen. Exactly. But you can control your tongue. You didn't know that the event was going to occur, things beyond your control, the winds, but you still have control of the rudder. You still have control of your tongue. And you can still make lemonade out of the lemons if you so choose to do so. Or you can turn around and, and just destroy the lemons and they can really be sour when you're hitting somebody else in the face with them, right? 
So Lord, help us to understand. But the point here with the ship is that the, the rudder takes over for all of these dangers, both for the large ship itself and for the strong winds. And without the rudder, guess what? Everything falls apart. Everything absolutely is destroyed. And so the elements are, are present in the two illustrations here. We've got a large entity that needs control, and we've got something very small that ends up providing that control. And then at the end, he says, you've got the will of the pilot, the person who is, is using control of the rudder, or the will of the person that has the control of the mouth. Oh, I just couldn't help myself. Yeah, we can. Oh, but I've just got an Irish temper. No excuse. Oh, but I come from wherever I come from and we're used to speaking our minds as a Christian. No excuse. Oh, but that's just the way. No, 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 no excuse. Because he says here at the end of this verse that the small rudder takes that ship wherever the inclination of the pilot desires it to go. The will of the person who is in control. And so his message is that you and I have to learn to control what we say because it determines how things are going to move forward in our lives, in our personal life, in our family life, in our church life. We've got to control the tongue and we must determine to do so. So here's what happens when we're out in traffic and somebody cuts us off. What happens when we lose control? We end up, our tongue ends up spewing out what's already in the heart. See, this is the power of the tongue. See, this is the problem. We say, oh, how did that slip out? I cannot believe that I said that. Well, believe it because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Oh, that's not me. That's not me. What do you mean it's not you? Uh, you know, it, 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 it's not a one-time thing. It's happening over and over and over. Oh, that's just not me. And we tend to want to give ourselves a pass. We judge everybody else by their actions, actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. It doesn't work that way. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if we're losing it all the time and that's what's coming out, it's because that's what's filled up in our hearts. Well, how can I avoid that? Well, one way we can probably avoid it, and I, I've had to learn this over the years, folks, there are some things that, that I might find somewhat enjoyable, very little, actually almost nothing now on TV. But over the years, you know, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, um, the, the movies that I would see at the time, there, were, there was a thing called the Hayes Code from about 1935 or 36 up and through the, the 50s where they had very strict control over things you could and couldn't say, over things you could and couldn't do. A lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people said, oh, this is censoring. But... You know, you could watch films, and, and for the most part, there was a cleanness to those. So I could go home and watch my Advent Costello, and I don't have to worry too much about, you know, there's, there's not going to be any bad words or anything. But as time progresses, now things begin to come out, and I'm getting to a point here. If you're having trouble with what's coming out from your mouth, don't feed in what you're hearing by choice. Oh, they, they curse at my work. Okay, you, 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 there's not a lot you can do in your work environment, but there's a lot we can do in our at-home environment and what we choose to be entertained by or not be entertained by. Well, I don't know why I'm having all these bad thoughts. Well, because you're watching things that are bad or you're consuming things that are bad. Now we've got a whole society of kids. I, I'm really shocked at, at, at not, and it's not just young people. It's older folk as well, but our society has become so profane. People just, I mean, talk and spew out language that even just a few years ago would have been unacceptable. And you see it. And, and if you're on YouTube and, uh, you know, a house is being built or something, and, oh, this looks interesting. Let me see what they're going to say about, you know, the well and how they, and, and the people that are talking, yeah, and I had a blank of a time doing blank. And it's like, wow, you can't even, people can't even describe things or talk without profanity now. Have you noticed that? Is this going over your head? Is this, I know we're all church people and, and maybe Lord willing, we never hear anything bad, but I, I got a feeling. So sometimes we have to cut back if we don't want out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaking things, then that's one of the things we have to do. And, and so, you know, this is the point, though, is that that rudder 
or that bit in the horse's mouth, the tongue, it can do all kinds of damage. The tongue lies, it speaks profanity, it releases criticism, it grumbles. Listen to me, the tongue produces obscene and foolish talk. And we're told in Ephesians 5, 4, that there should not be any obscenity, foolish talk, or vulgar joking, which are out of place, but there is to be giving of thanks. I've at times been ashamed to be amongst other Christians and hear vulgar jokes. I mean, not just off color, and that's bad enough, but really vulgar stuff. It should have no place in the minds of the people of God or in the lips of the people of God as we speak to one another. Amen? Amen. The rudder controls the ship. How you speak, you say, that's not how I feel. I'm really, I've got a golden heart. Yeah, I let it go once in a while with my mouth, but oh, I've got a heart of gold. No, you really don't. You're telling yourself you do to make yourself feel better, but you really don't. Our words are as big an indicators of what's in our heart as anything else. You show me someone's fake book page. I'll show you what's in their heart because what they're thinking about is what they're posting about. You show me somebody's social media feed. All these things. So, so we've got to understand. Have you ever thought about this? Ten Commandments. Who can name them all real quick? In order. Okay. So you can't? That's okay. You know them all, right? I want you to think about this. Did you, have you ever thought of this? Two of the Ten Commandments deal with sins that are expressed by the tongue. You've got the third commandment, which forbids taking God's name in vain. And then you go all the way up to the ninth commandment, which forbids bearing false witness against your neighbor. Two of the Ten Commandments, God said two of these things deal specifically with sins of the tongue. Taking God's name in vain or bearing false witness against your neighbor. And those are two things that are prohibitions that have no place in the child of God's heart or life. Amen? So, th so these are serious things to think about. Uh, Paul kind of summed up Jew and Gentile life, the entirety of, of, of those two races as it was, this way. Romans 3, verses 10 through 14. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not even one single person. And then he says this, their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Wow. The power of the tongue. Like the bit in the horse's mouth, like the rudder on the ship, it directs and controls everything. If we, I'm just going to say one more thing, we're going to move on. If you're wondering about your life and how you feel, you know, oftentimes we say, well, my, my tongue mirrors my feelings. But did you know that really you can also reverse that? Begin to worship and to praise God. Amen. Begin to be a thankful person instead of a grumbling person. Amen? This doesn't apply to me because I'm perfect, but I'm just giving this to the rest of you. So my family's not going to say, hey, dad, take your, no. Um, they will. But for all of us, there's something to this. As we speak, even if we're just speaking to ourselves, and sometimes you're the only person that's willing to listen to you, um, speak words that bring blessing and glory and honor to God. Worship him and praise him instead of grumbling. And it's amazing how your feelings will begin to change and line up. See, our words, uh, our words come out of our heart, but we can also be careful with our words, and I think they can change our mindset and our feelings and our direction. And that's what James is saying here. The rudder of the ship controls where the ship is headed. You can blow up a relationship or you can mend a relationship with your words. Amen? All right, so now we move on to verse 5. So also, here's the third illustration. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. So illustration number three, like the bit, like the rudder, the small part of the body does great damage through boasting, and we'll get to the boasting part in just a moment. But I was thinking about, I grew up in the age of the space shuttles when they were taking off. And shortly after I graduated uh, from high school, a couple of years later, um, before I took off, right before I took off for Bible college, still living in Tampa, um, and the space shuttle, if you remember correctly, Challenger went up in 1986. And we know the tragedy that took place 
And many of us were watching it as it ascended up into the, the heavens, so to speak. And suddenly, boom, there's just giant. And at first, people didn't know, oh, that's just one of the rockets dislodging and it's moving on to the next phase. No. Suddenly, all of a sudden, and if you ever see the video, you're hearing people cheering. And then suddenly, it takes a moment. But then everybody realizes a disaster has taken place. Do you know why the Challenger blew up? A couple of small rubber O-rings, because of the temperature that day being a little bit cool, loosened up. And because these small rubber O-rings loosened up, it created just enough, enough of an of a unsealing of joints that needed to be sealed tightly. And then tragedy strikes. The entire space shuttle goes kablooey. Just something so small. So simple that people wouldn't even, you wouldn't even think in a million years, this giant spacecraft and these little rubber O-rings loosening up and the joint is not sealed correctly and everything is destroyed. And folks, do we not realize that lives, not only were lost then, but lives are destroyed when you and I can, cannot control this small little thing that we call the tongue. All the damage that has been done because someone's tongue got a little too loose. Just couldn't control their tongue. This is a real thing. I see it in church all the time. Sadly, people can't control their tongues. They speak when they shouldn't speak. Better to say nothing. And I'm not joking now about this. Really and truly, better oftentimes to say nothing than to even sometimes think, well, I got to say something. You know how some of us, we come into, we get into a spot where there's that awkward silence. And there's some families that are more silent than others. My dad and his side of the family, they'll sit down for a meal and they'll eat their meal and they will not carry on a long conversation. And it took uh, other members of my family a little time to pick up on this because their family, you talked over the meal. I mean, it was, you know, take a bite and oh, by the way, yeah, yeah, and you're talking the whole time and they were quiet and it becomes sometimes uncomfortable. Well, I need to say something. What's going on here? Why is it so quiet? Well, that's just the way they are. That's just that side of the family. So I'm, I'm content. I'll just enjoy my meal. But sometimes you feel like you have to speak, but sometimes we don't even need to speak. Sometimes we feel like there's an awkwardness of, oh, I need to say something. This person's hurting or something. sometimes better to say nothing. Sometimes better just to, to keep quiet, right? Because the more you speak, the more likely you are to sin. If you are wise, keep quiet. Amen? That, that's, I'm telling you, that's Proverbs. We need to remember this. We've got to be careful. And he says the tongue, it's small, but what does he say? It boasts of these great things. And here's the point of that. It makes these boasts that it cannot back up. So I think of all of these these guys in school, these little guys go around and, and oh, you better get out of my way. I'll beat you up. And, and it's like, you, this little guy? And nine times out of ten, they couldn't do anything. But the tongue would say things that their body could not back up. And sometimes they would get in real trouble for that because they'd end up getting pounded. Better to say nothing. Even though there's this boast of, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And the scriptures, you know, speak of this. Psalm 12, verses 3 and 4 is one of the best passages. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and every boastful tongue that says this. We will triumph with our tongues. We own our lips. Who is our master? The psalmist says, Lord, deal with those people that think they're in control and that they can just make and break everything by their words. And there are these people that have this power and they, oh, I'll crush you with what I say. I can either make or break you, right? The old thing we used to watch, right? You're fired. <laughs> I mean, it's not a joke. You can make and break people. You can destroy people's lives. You're hired or you're fired. I mean, just simple words, but they mean everything. So the tongue boasts of many things. And some people that get into positions of power don't realize one day they will give an account before God. Everyone will give an account before God and there will be no out talking God. There will be no, well, I don't care what you say, God. Well, he's the final arbiter. Amen. And he's the one that will say either you're hired or you're fired. 
<laughs> and you don't want to hear I'm fired from God because it's going to take on a whole new meaning. Amen. So it's a serious thing. So the tongue is small, but it can boast of great things. And then we'll get to the last one in the second half of verse five. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Illustration number four. Great fires started by small sparks. So Derek will know about this. The Ranch Fire, 2018. Absolutely incredible. The, the, the California's largest wildfire, over 410,000 acres lost. And you know what it was caused by? A man was out on his property and he was just pounding a stake in to the ground and the little spark from that hammer went and is either the spark or just a little piece of, of hot metal went right over into some brush right there by it that was kindled and he didn't stay long enough to recognize and he went back in. By the time he comes back out, all of a sudden here's this big fire and it spreads and it does all this major damage. Just one small little spark. Just one, oh, I'm just, I'm just hammering something in. I'm not meaning to do this. But yet look at the destruction and the mayhem. And we could go over and over. Oh, it's just a small little campfire. We're just roasting some marshmallows. We thought we had put it all out. One little spark, one little ember somewhere gets on to a, a very flammable spot. And all of a sudden, boom, people's lives are lost. All because of one simple little spark. And that's what James is getting at here. Entire families, folk, have been separated over just that one little spark. Entire churches have been destroyed, sometimes over one little spark, one little word said in the wrong way. May God help us just to recognize the power of the tongue, that we don't, we can't go around and take for granted. And see, this is the problem. We live in a society where everybody just says whatever is on their mind. That's, we've grown up in that society of you got to zing somebody else before they zing you. Make sure you correct them before they correct you. Make sure you rebuke them before, you know, whatever it might be. And, and we live in an angry society. And I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed to say it. I see Christians that celebrate and clap with words from the tongues of people that, they're, that we have no business clapping. No business at all, and yet I see even Christians doing this. May God help us all to not celebrate what the world celebrates, but to only celebrate and magnify what God celebrates and magnifies. Amen? May the Lord help us with these things. Ephesians 4.29 says this, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. That's the command of the Lord to this, uh, to us as the church. And so if we look at this verse and we think about it, we're told not to let any corrupting talk come out of our mouths. What's corrupting talk? Just real quick, what is that? It's not limited to just profanity or obscene speech. It's a lot more than that. It includes all the various types of, of I'll use the word negative speech, lying, slander, Critical speech, sometimes even when it's true, there can still be a spirit behind that. That's why we're called to be gentle with our words. Harsh words, insults, sarcasm, ridicule. I see some of these preachers on TV, one that I actually know pretty well because I had classes with him. And he cannot bring a message to the people that he speaks to without some form of ridicule and sarcasm and anger. Every message he preaches. There's no grace, and yet people applaud and they love it. Oh, he's on TV. He follows after his daddy. Uh, but he's worse than his daddy, much worse. His daddy didn't have the same spirit that he does. Ridicule, sarcasm from the pulpit. It's wrong. You've heard me talk about some of these ministers, by the way, that use profanity in the pulpit. It can't happen. No unwholesome speech. I want you to note Paul gives an absolute prohibition here in Ephesians chapter 4. No corrupting talk, none whatsoever. What does this mean for us? No gossip, no sarcasm, no critical speech, no harsh words. All of these sinful words that tend to tear down another person have to be taken out of our speech because we're not called to tear down. Can you imagine what the church of Jesus Christ would be today 
and what it would look like if we really all sought to apply the Apostle Paul's words. If we really took what James had to say and were super serious about it. You see, as believers, God, by his spirit, he does give us self-control. We have his spirit abiding within. We can't say, I couldn't help it. The devil made me do it. Oh, that devil made me say that bad word. No, no, no. If you're a Christian, the spirit of God abides in you. We have the ability because the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, all of that. What does it end with? Self-control. So we can watch our words. And we have to watch our words. And I'm going to ask Brother Ivor if he would come. You see, the key for us is we're called to build up and to not tear down. That's what edify means, to build up one another, not to tear one another down. How many of you were there on October 8th, 1871? <laughs> Something happened that day. It's actually a real tragedy. Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over the lantern at 8.30 p.m. Give you a history lesson if you don't know about it. That led to the Great Chicago Fire. Absolutely horrendous fire. It left over 100,000 people homeless, uh, 17,500 buildings destroyed. Over 300 people died in that fire, and $40 million worth of damage was done. Why? Because a cow kicked over a lantern? Something that, that's nothing. And yet look at what took place. Folks, one match can burn down an entire house. It's all it takes. Just one, oh, I was only playing. I didn't really, really wasn't thinking about it. The tongue is like a match and it can set everything aflame. And that's what James is saying. May God help us to watch because there is great power in the tongue to either build up and encourage and edify or to just burn everything down. And we live in a world today where I actually hear people talking that way. Just burn it all down. It's all garbage. Let's burn it all down. Get me the guy to come in here and throw the gasoline on the fire. Let's burn the nation down. Let's burn all the everything because it's all corrupt anyhow. What a nihilistic attitude. Uh, the, the believer can't have that attitude. Ah, oh, just, you know, we're not to burn bridges. We've got to be so careful. May God help us to be people that understand the power of the tongue, but then use it for his glory and his honor and not to allow destructive behavior from it. Are you with me on that? Let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray tonight that this message will have found receptive hearts. Lord, folk that are here live, folk that would watch over the internet, Lord, and see the video, I pray, Father, each and every one of us as believers, you've given us the ability to speak. Lord, we have to speak your word. We have to, everything needs to be seasoned with grace and we need to be edifying and building up and not tearing down. And I just pray for all of us, Lord, myself included, please, Lord, help us to learn control of the tongue for it controls the whole body and it controls our life in many, many ways, more than we can even really begin to imagine. If anyone here has been struggling with uh, loose lips, so to speak, which sink ships. Then, Father, I pray tonight would be the night we'd get a hold of this truth. And maybe we could do our own little Bible study and, and start going through and looking what the Bible has to say about the tongue and about our speech. Or maybe we need to be reminded of these things. Maybe we should write some scriptures down. The Ephesians 4.29 and other scriptures and maybe look at them every day and, and quote them. Maybe memorize some of the verses like I did from Proverbs, Lord. That, that we would just be mindful that our words are powerful and they have an effect. It can be bad or it can be good. I pray our words bring glory and honor to you and encouragement to the church of Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that I ask these things. Amen and amen.